It is therefore time for question period, the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontario has suffered another fiscal setback due solely to the actions of this Premier. Moody's credit rating agency has downgraded the province's credit outlook from stable to negative as a direct result of their election document budget. Moody said, quote, spending pressure will challenge the province's ability to sustain balanced fiscal results across multiple years. Moody also assumes the budget will lead to, quote, an upward trend in the debt burden and a faster rate in interest expense than previously anticipated. Speaker, why is this Premier, in her shameless bid to cling to power, putting Ontario in an even more precarious financial position and harming Ontario's reputation in the process? Question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker, and I know the Minister of Finance is going to want to comment in the supplementary. Uh, let me just say, and this is uh, part of the uh, part of the. Um, uh, message that the um, member opposite neglected, which is that Moody's has confirmed our AA credit rating, Mr. Speaker. Um, they, they have adjusted their outlook. We know that. But this is not a credit rating downgrade. Ontario's debt continues to be highly marketable, and that reflects, Mr. Speaker, the confidence of investors in our economy. Um, what, while we value and we do value the, uh, the input of the rating agencies, Mr. Speaker, our responsibility is, and it always will be, to support the care and opportunity for people in this province. That's the role of government, to do the things that people cannot do by themselves. I know that the Minister of Finance is working with the rating agencies, and he will comment, Mr. Speaker, but our Credit rating has been Answer. confirmed, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to work to make sure that people in this province has everything. The people Can in the province have everything that they need, Mr. Speaker. I'm getting the signals. Supplementary. Now back to the Premier. Well, Speaker, this is not any kind of a forecast from Moody's. This is an outright condemnation of this government's fiscal policies. The Premier likes to say she is making, quote, conscious choices that plunge Ontario into deficit. But the fact is that this government used money from reserves and the sale of assets to try to artificially balance the budget. Speaker, it's not a conscious choice, it's a consequence of one-time money running out. They ran out of things to sell, Speaker. This means we need more money to pay interest on our debt, and less money is now available for needed services. So, Speaker, Moody sees right through this cling to power. Does the Premier really expect Ontario families won't? Thank you. Premier. Thanks. Premier Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and the member um, quotes Moody, so I'm going to quote Moody as well. And here it is, word for word. The affirmation of the AA rating for the province of Ontario reflects the province's ability to rely on a large, diversified economic base wow. with sound wealth generation that supports a strong provincial revenue base, a greater degree of flexibility relative to global peers to accommodate revenue and expenditure pressures, and prudent debt management. Mr. Speaker, investors are investing in Ontario for a reason because we're making it happen and we are relying on our economic engine of the economy to support all of Canada. We're the largest net contributor to the Federation as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. What the Minister failed to mention was how many downgrades we had, and that's why we're only at AA, Speaker. The worst part of all this is the Premier has been warned time and time again about the consequences of her spend-at-all-costs approach. The Auditor General repeatedly told us that increasing debt interest payments will crowd out the services families rely on. That's why the Liberals have closed hospital beds and fired 1,600 nurses, and that's why 100 frontline health care workers in Sudbury are worried about their jobs this very morning. The government's lack of financial discipline is exactly why they received a condemnation from Moody's. They can't be trusted, Speaker. Is this Premier proud that Liberal self-interest and a desperate attempt to cling to power is hurting Question. Ontario's reputation? Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's exactly because of our fiscal discipline that we over and, and we beat our targets year over year, ninth year in a row, Mr. Speaker. 
We balanced the budget last year. We have a surplus of $600 million. Furthermore, we're the leanest government in all of Canada. Yes, our, our interest on debt is a function of our revenue. Mr. Speaker, it was $0.15 cents for every dollar when they were in power. Today, it's under $0.08, cents, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to take what steps are necessary to invest, unlike what this minister is suggesting. In this budget, we have tremendous investments to provide for health care, public education, social programs, infrastructure spending. The very things that they say we should do, they're voting against, Mr. Speaker. The people of Ontario need a strong economy. We're diversifying that economy. And Moody's has affirmed that the province of Ontario is being prudent in our debt management. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Perth, Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier believe $6 million is an acceptable salary for the CEO of Hydro One? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Premier, Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Once again, um, you know, I'm pleased to rise and, and talk uh, to the same question. Um, you know, we, we recognize that the executive salaries at uh, Hydro One are high compared to the vast majority of Ontario salaries, and that we remain committed to Hydro One's regulation and accountability and, and transparency through our government's involvement as a majority shareholder. Um, you know, Mr. Speaker, um, the gimmick that we're seeing from the other side, especially from the leader uh, of that party, Mr. Speaker, is going to drive us down to the same mess that we're seeing south of the border, Mr. Speaker. You know, this isn't going to do anything to actually take a single cent off of anyone's hydro bills, Mr. Speaker. Not one single cent. But you know what did, Mr. Speaker? Was our fair hydro plan. Our fair hydro plan made sure that we reduced Answer. rates by 25 percent on average, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to put forward policy and not bumper stickers like the gimmick that they're doing, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary, the member from Halliburton, Port Lake Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and back to the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, is $6 million an acceptable salary for the CEO of Hydro One? Thank you. What did Deb Martin get? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, is voting against 25 percent reductions for families right across this province yeah, right. something that you know, everyone should do, Mr. Speaker? No. Yes, it should, Mr. Speaker, and it's this party that did it. On that side of the House, we used to talk about them as being the party that had no plan, Mr. Speaker. And then they had a weekend where they brought forward a plan, and they were keeping the Fair Hydro plan, Mr. Speaker, and that was something that we thought was great, but they should have voted for it when they had a chance. But now that plan has disappeared again, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, and they are once again the party that has no plan. The only thing that they can talk about, Mr. Speaker, is Hydro One CEO salary. And yes, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that executive salaries are high, but when it comes to actually making a difference and taking Costs off of bills, Mr. Answer. Speaker. We reduce those bills, especially in Hydro One areas, by up to 50 percent because of our action, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary, the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. It is shocking to see the Liberals defend their $6 million man. Mr. Speaker, how does the Premier defend the salary of the, uh, of the Hydro One CEO? Thank you, Minister. Thank you one, uh, once again, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, it's our government that understands that affordability is critical for families and businesses. And as I've said before, Mr. Speaker, that's why we launched Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan, reducing rates by 25% on average for all residential consumers, as well as many as a half a million small businesses and farms. And our plan is working, Mr. Speaker. You know, a recent report by the Environmental Commissioner reconfirmed that Ontario's families and small businesses pay less on average than many other North American jurisdictions. Families in cities like New York, Boston and San Francisco pay more than double the average of Ontario, and consumers in Charlottetown, Regina, Halifax and Moncton are paying more than the Ontario average, Mr. Speaker. By bringing down prices for customers, we're continuing to increase fairness and create more opportunity for Ontario families, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue Answer. to find ways and bring forward policy that helps. They can keep forward bringing forward bumper sticker policies, Mr. Speaker. New question, a member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is, is for the Prime Minister. Premier. Hospitals. And the Premier refuses to admit it. Over the last 15 years, it is that government that created this crisis. 
and after 15 years, they are still ignoring it and denying it. The CEO of Lake of the Woods Hospital said, and I quote, we did not receive the average 4.6% increase that was mentioned in the provincial budget. We received significantly less than that. The Premier needs to admit that there is a problem, and she needs to explain to Ontarians from Kenora to King Street why she isn't fixing this crisis. Why is it that the Premier refuses to properly fund Question. our hospitals? Well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I had the privilege this morning of being at um, uh, one of the campuses of Sunnybrook, uh, the orthopedic uh, centre at Holland uh, Centre, and uh, reaffirmed our announcement, Mr. Speaker, of the near billion dollar investment in uh, health care that's included in our budget, Mr. Speaker, that will specifically go to hospitals to reduce wait times, Mr. Speaker. And, um, and I recognize that uh, there's, uh, there's variability across the province, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly why Health Quality Ontario has a Northern Ontario health equity strategy. It's very important that, you know, on just about every policy file, Mr. Speaker, in Ontario, at one point or another, you will run up against geography because this is a massive province, Mr. Speaker, mm -hmm. and the population is unevenly distributed. So that's why having an equity policy is important, Mr. Speaker. I'll talk more about it in the supplementary. But the, the member opposite knows that uh, overall, the increase in funding to hospitals Answer. in Ontario is 4.6 percent, and there was variation uh, among hospitals in terms of the increases that they got. Thank you. Supplement. When the CEO of a hospital comes out publicly and says they are being underfunded, we have a problem. Here's what he said. We have many unmet needs here. There is a lot to be dealt with. We are hoping that there will be some additional support. Why, for yet another year, is the Premier ignoring the needs of our hospital system? Thank you. Speaker, and you know, we, we recognize that there's a need for more investment in hospitals. And I let me just talk about the uh, the health equity strategy because I'd I'd love to, as the premier, have a conversation with the CEO of that hospital or any of the CEOs of hospitals around the province, Mr. Speaker, because they are they are on the front line, and we worked with them as we developed our budget, Mr. Speaker. We listened to them, and we made the increases that they and the OHA uh, deemed were necessary. Mr. Speaker, but the health equity policy um, recognizes that there is a need for different uh, strategies in different parts of the province, Mr. Speaker. And last year, for example, we announced $222 million over three years to support Ontario's first ever First Nations Health Action Plan, including an additional $145 million every year, Mr. Speaker, recognizing Answer. that there are needs. We also announced investing $19 million in capital funding to support uh, a facility at Health Sciences North for the Northern Ontario School of Medicine and a new wing Thank in Thunder you. Bay to consolidate specialized Thank you. Final supplementary. The Liberals have had 15 long years to see the crisis in our hospitals coming. They've had 15 long years to step up and address the aging of the population, a change that we could see coming for decades. Now, with the countdown on, to 50 days to go, they're still pretending that the problem does not exist. The good news for people is that hope is coming. New Democrats are going to end hallway medicine. Why did the Premier let this crisis happen in our hospitals? You, Speaker, you know, and as I said yesterday to the member opposite, um, we invested an increased funding to Health Sciences North, the uh, the health system in the uh, jurisdiction that she represents, and our terrific member from Sudbury. Uh, we increased over two years that funding by ten million dollars, wow. Mr. Speaker. That's that is a substantial increase uh, for uh, for Health Sciences North, and you know, we we have recognize that across the province there's a need for an increase in funding, Mr. Speaker. But that, that builds on the investments that every year we have made. There has been a huge investment.
investment in home care, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The reality is that more people want to stay in their homes. We need to make sure that those supports are in place. We need to make sure that uh, acute care beds continue to be supported. We increased the uh, acute care Answer. beds in the province by 1,200 as a result of the surge, the flu surge this uh, this winter, Mr. Speaker. And we will move to make those beds permanent, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that there's more that needs to be done. New question, the member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. When a person needs long-term care, they deserve to know that they'll be safe. They deserve to be treated with dignity and with respect. But yesterday we learned there's a home in Thunder Bay that has 44, yes, I repeat, 44 compliance, non-compliance orders. The Liberals have been in power for 15 long years. How did the Premier let this happen? Sure, as, I, uh, as I just said in my previous answer, more people want to stay in their homes. And what that has meant, Mr. Speaker, is that there has been substantial investment in, uh, in home care, Mr. Speaker. We also have, uh, have uh, re-renovated, have upgraded thousands of long-term care beds across the province, Mr. Speaker. We are building more. We, have, uh, we are in the process of building 5,000 5, new long-term care beds right now, Mr. Speaker. But we're also, we're also looking at and funding models like what are called naturally occurring retirement communities, Mr. Speaker. So where there is a group of seniors who are already living in, a, in an apartment, and there's an example in Kingston, Mr. Speaker, uh, Oasis, I believe. I believe it's called, Mr. Speaker, where these seniors are living together. They want to Answer. stay there. If they have some medical support, like a personal support worker, they can stay and age in place. Mr. Speaker, there's a range of supports that we have put in place. Thank you. We recognize there's more to be done. Final, uh, supplementary. Speaker, what about staffing the existing long-term care beds? <laughs> Records show that Bethany Nursing Home, many of their residents were given only a single bath during the month of January, wow. one bath in a month wow. per resident. Wow. Seniors are wise, they've lived through a lot, and we should be treasuring their contributions. These are our parents, these are the people who built Ontario to what it is today. New Democrats will immediately fix that problem. We'll find and fix with an inquiry in our long-term care system so that we can start to fix these problems, which have developed over the last 15 years. Why did the Premier allow our long-term care system to get like this. Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know the uh, member opposite rep um, referenced a specific situation in Thunder Bay. I know that the uh, the member for Atacokan is going to be meeting with um, with uh, folks on the ground there tomorrow. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, you know. The reality is that in terms of uh, long-term care in this province, all long-term care homes are overseen by a rigorous inspection system, a regulatory framework, Mr. Speaker, which includes an annual inspection to ensure compliance. And we, we have reinforced and increased though, that oversight, Mr. Speaker. Uh, all the results from every inspection are posted online and in the homes themselves. I recognize, Mr. Speaker, that we have to be vigilant. These are some of the most vulnerable people in our society, which is why we have increased the vigilance, yes, increased the oversight, and, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to work with long-term care providers to make sure that those are enforced. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, those 44 non-compliance issues didn't happen over overnight. Staff at Bethany Nursing Home are dedicated and caring. They're doing their best, and they're being worked off their feet. They are understaffed. Sometimes it takes more than an hour for a resident to have a call answered in their room and for the staff to respond. The stories we've heard out of Bethany are heartbreaking. They're almost too hard to tell. Everyone feels really bad what is happening uh, here at Bethany. And when did the Premier learn about those problems in our long-term care system, and why hasn't she fixed them? Mr. Speaker, as I said, um, we have been over some time been taking action to support uh, our growing and aging population and to reinforce and increase the vigilance in the long-term care system, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that, as I said, these are some of the most uh, vulnerable people in our society, and they deserve to have they deserve to have every care possible. So, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to make sure that 
uh, that homes are compliant. Uh, our members work with uh, local homes, but there is a system of oversight and a system of inspection. And, Mr. Speaker, I think it's very legitimate that there would be questions asked in a situation like this. Those questions need answers, and that's exactly what the system, the framework of, uh, of oversight is in place to do, is to answer those answer. questions and determine why such a situation would have arisen. Your new question. The member from Simcoe Gray. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Questions to uh, the Premier. Uh, Speaker, the Premier held another campaign-style event this morning, this time at a Toronto hospital, and she's heading downtown later today for another platform announcement. This egregious abuse of taxpayers' money must come to an end. Speaker, how much are these campaign-style events costing the taxpayers today? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again, I, uh, I understand why the member opposite would focus on that and not the substance of the announcements that we are making relevant to our budget, Mr. Speaker, because making a nearly billion-dollar investment in hospitals, Mr. Wow. Speaker, to increase wait times when we are all Speaker, we are already um, leading the country in terms of, uh, of wait times, Mr. Speaker. This afternoon, I'll be talking. I will give everyone credit. We got this far without having to go to warnings. I'd like to see if we could do it all the way. So let's do that. Right. This afternoon, I'll be talking about uh, climate change, Mr. Speaker, with Michael wow. Bloomberg, and climate change in the context of corporate responsibility. I am quite Answer. sure that's a subject that the member opposite really doesn't want to touch, doesn't want to talk about climate change, and doesn't want to talk about reining in Thank you. corporate pollution, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Go back to the Premier. Even if the Premier wants to pretend otherwise, she's clearly campaigning on the taxpayer's dime. Shameful. It's shady and it's unethical, and it needs to stop. Uh, the mem Excuse me. The, the member will withdraw. Uh, withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Once again, the Liberals had ministers out this morning using taxpayers' money for campaign-style photo ops. Shame on you, Premier. Yep. Speaker, will the Liberal Party do the right thing? and pay back the taxpayers for these campaign-style events. You're out talking about your budget. You told us that was your platform. These are campaign-style events, and they've got to stop. Well, thank you very much, and, and thanks to the member opposite for highlighting that ministers are doing their jobs uh, by being out in communities and talking about things that is important to Ontarians. We're proud to do our jobs and we'll continue to do our jobs. But I think it's kind of really evident, Speaker, that the party opposite and Doug Ford are panicked. They're panicked because they are worried that, that they're going to, people are going to find out that they're going to cut, 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 cut. OHIP Plus, that they're going to cut, 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 cut. expansion to OHIP Plus that they are going to cut in significant investments to bring wait times down, that they're going to cut supports for students through OSAP, where 225,000 students are going to colleges and universities without paying any tuition fees. They are worried about, Speaker, that these important policies that are making difference in people's lives, uh, that, that they are going to cut those things, and they don't want people to know about those things. Thank you. New question, the member from Welland. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Premier. 3,000 York University faculty are still on strike taking a stand against insecure academic jobs and chronic underfunding of the university post-secondary system, even though the Liberal government is not. Tens of thousands of York University students now face a real threat of not graduating as they have planned their lives, careers, and their futures, which are now uncertain. I received a letter from a nursing student at York. She's been told by the university they need to make up all their practical hours in order to graduate, which is impossible as the strike drags on and they run the real risk of losing their placement. What does the Premier have to say to the student about why their gradu graduation is now in jeopardy? Thank you, Premier. Uh, Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Mr. of Advanced Education and Skills Development. 
Speaker, um, you know, this situation is, uh, is certainly very challenging, and it's, it's challenging particularly for the students at York University. Since the beginning of the strike, Speaker, uh, I made it very, very clear that our priority is on the students, on getting both sides to come together to reach a fair uh, resolution to both sides on this, uh, on this issue so that we can put uh, our students at the forefront and, um, and, and bring them back to the learning that they're there to do. You know, Mr. Speaker, it's disappointing that an agreement has not yet been reached. Um, the Ministry of Labour has, uh, has pr provided uh, support all the way through um, this process and, uh, and this week uh, appointed uh, a commissioner to, uh, to talk to both Answer. sides. A number of meetings have already been held, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and you know, we need to get both sides talking Thank and you. looking at a resolution. Uh, back to the Premier. Another York uh, student actually contacted me yesterday. He's a political science major, and he's concerned that for the second time in their four-year program, a dispute has threatened their ability to actually graduate. One side has been at the table the, and has been there for the last six weeks. The publicly funded administration at York University has not been at the table. Shame. The government appointed an industrial uh, relations commission to examine the outstanding issues, issues in dispute. But having the lowest per student funding, uh, I think, in uh, Canada is part of the dispute in post-secondary education under this Liberal government. The Premier can still apply pressure to the publicly funded administration of York University to tell them to get back to the table, because it takes two sides Question. at the table to actually reach an agreement. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, our focus and our priority is on the students. Uh, York University has Period. Speaker, York University has remained open, and uh, students are attending classes. Um, so, you know, this uh, this is um, a very challenging situation. I've connected with both sides multiple times, Mr. Speaker. It's a very, very tough situation. We respect the collective bargaining process, and uh, and we are calling on both sides in this situation to think about a compromise, put the needs of the students first get back to the table Answer. and re resolve this issue that is fair and equitable to both sides. Thank you. New question. The member from Barrie. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. In 2014, Ontario signed a Memorandum of Understanding with Quebec regarding electricity trade. In 2016, we announced an, an expanded seven-year deal that will help make electricity in Ontario more affordable, clean and reliable. Speaker, this de deal was beneficial for both provinces because it helped ensure electricity supply for when it was needed most. That's right. In Quebec, they need electricity during the coldest winter days due to their use of electric heat. In Ontario, we need it at the height of the summer. This MOU helped to ensure both our provinces had the supply we needed at those times. Just as importantly, the imports of cheap hydroelectricity from Quebec will offset reliance on natural gas power plants, reducing Ontario's greenhouse Question. gas emissions by 1 million tonnes each year. Today, the Financial Accountability Officer released a report on this deal. Minister, can you please update us thank on you. the findings? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member for that question and, of course, her tireless work for her constituents. And I also want to thank Mr. Speaker, the Financial Accountability Officer, for his report and the analysis uh, of our electricity trade agreement uh, with Quebec. Um, as the member noted, electricity demand peaks at different times in our province. Uh, that means there is the opportunity to coordinate our electricity systems in ways that are beneficial uh, to both provinces. And through the expanded electricity trade, and in this deal, our province is set to import up to two terawatts of clean hydroelectric power from Quebec annually. That's enough power to power the entire city of Kitchener for a year, for example, Mr. Right. Speaker. The report confirms that what we've always said about this uh, trade agreement, it strengthens system reliability and cost effectiveness for both provinces. And the FAO report outlines that this deal will reduce system costs in our province by $38 million over the life Answer. of the year. 
This uh, are savings both to ratepayers uh, across the province, and I look forward to talking more about this in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, thank you to the minister for the response. An additional part of this deal is an agreement to re reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Over the past 15 years, Ontario has become a leader in the global fight against climate change. Here, here. Just last year, our electricity systems was over 95 percent free of emissions that cause climate change. This is due to the nearly $70 billion that has been invested to modernize the system since 2003, which included the elimination of dirty, coal-fired electricity generation. Right. However, we must continue to work hard on reducing our carbon footprint. Just two days ago, Governor Jerry Brown warned us what could happen if polluters are given a free pass, something the official opposition wants to do. Speaker, Jeez. through you to the minister, could the Minister of Energy please explain how this electricity trade agreement reduces Question. greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is right in pointing out that Ontario has become a leader in the fight against climate change. Just last week, the province's environmental commissioner pointed that out, Mr. Speaker. Replacing coal-fired electricity with renewable gas, nuclear conservation and natural gas has cleaned our air, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and increased um, electrical grid capacity and resilience, Mr. Speaker. She also said that taking coal out of the electricity system dramatically reduced Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions and has improved air quality and public health. And now the FAO's report confirms that the trade agreement will result in Quebec imports continuing to replace 2.3 terawatt hours of natural gas generation each year and reduces GHG emissions by almost 1 million tonnes per year. Now that's some real action on change, uh, climate change, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Our government is continuing to ensure that our electricity is clean, reliable, Thank and you. affordable, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. To the, to the Premier. Speaker, this Premier likes to talk the talk about fairness, but when it comes to actions, she certainly doesn't walk the walk. The latest example is this government arguing against transparency in our tribunals. The Premier is using the public. Clock the clock. The Chief Government Whip is warm. We're now in warnings. Thank you. Thank you. The latest example is this government arguing against transparency in our tribunals. The Premier is using the public purse to fight a court battle with the Toronto Star, who are ch challenging the secrecy of our tribunals that keep adjudicative decisions and records, which are public property, paid for the taxpayer, from the public. This legal battle is the epitome of an old and tired government. They are using our money to fight against releasing our records. Abusing the public purse in order to keep the tribunal failures hidden and secret behind closed doors breaks a fundamental tenet that justice must be seen to be done. Speaker, what is fair about that? Thank you. Thank you. Attorney General. General. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. I thank the member for the for the con uh, the question. Um, I think the uh, Speaker, as you heard, the member reference a court case that is ongoing. It will be highly inappropriate for me to to discuss uh, and debate the merits um, of this uh, of that case um, in the in the House. What I would say, Speaker, broadly, uh, that of course we very much uh, uh, value transparency and to make sure that that information uh, is is available as readily as possible. But, Speaker, one has to be also mindful of uh, privacy and confidentiality uh, as well. So, when uh, when one is looking at records that may be before a court or tribunal, uh, there are considerations around privacy and confidentiality. Uh, but as, as I said, Minister. Uh, speaker, this matter is before the courts, and we will leave it up to the courts yes, to make a determination. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier, it is this government who is arguing in the court. They're arguing that tribunals which adjudicate disputes, that impose heavy fines and punishments and sanctions, and can revoke people's licenses and accreditations and take away their livelihoods, they're arguing that these are not really courts. Tribunals such as the Human Rights, the OLRB, the LAT, and dozens more have both the form and function of our courts, but none of the safeguards of impartiality, openness, 
and due process. Speaker, the Premier's willingness to fight Canada's largest circulation newspaper in court to hide the records and decisions of these public matters raised red flags. Speaker, it's time for this Premier Question. to mandate tribunals make their records open and accessible, and why is this Premier working to frustrate and distort the basic principles of an open court, which are essential to our judicial system? Speaker, the, the member opposite very well knows that this is not a matter to be litigated uh, in the House. Uh, this is a matter that is before the courts, and that is the, the most appropriate place for it uh, to be heard. Uh, speaker, I think, uh, uh, as you have noted in the past, and members know of the subjudice rules that that uh, yeah. requires all MPPs not to engage uh, in making comments about matters that are before the courts. And as uh, the Attorney General, it is my responsibility to ensure that administration of justice in our province is independent of any partisan concerns. So for therefore, Speaker, I'm not going to uh, comment uh, on the specific of this case, but to say that transparency and accountability is a very fundamental principle, as a, as a principle uh, that the government holds uh, uh, very uh, uh, dear to us. Uh, but what has to Answer. be also be mindful around confidentiality and privacy of information as well. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last night, my riding in Niagara Falls, I ho hosted a health care town hall with my colleague from Nickel Belt. You can say there isn't a crisis in health care. Well, we had people talk about issues like long-term care, mental health access, hallway medicine, and so many other problems. I can assure you there is a crisis. I'd like the Premier to respond to one story. One speaker told us about a young girl who is struggling to get mental health supports. The wait lists are so long that she finds herself going to the emergency department for help only to be discharged back onto the wait list. Speaker, 12,000 young people, just like her on wait lists for mental health support. With the resources we have in this province, how has the Premier and the Liberal government allowed this to happen to our young people? Well, Mr. Speaker, I am very sympathetic to, and I, I use the example of families with children who are looking for mental health supports yeah. all the time, Mr. Speaker. I recognize, and I think we all can recognize in this House, that as a society, Mr. Speaker, we have had to and do have to up our game in terms of supports for mental health. There have been wonderful um, campaigns in the last decade, Mr. Speaker, that have shone a light on mental health and have uh, raised awareness of mental health. Bell Let's Talk is one of the examples of that, Mr. Speaker. And there are members in each one of our caucuses that have worked very, very hard in their own communities and across the province to raise awareness about mental health challenges. The reality is that 25 years ago, as a society, we didn't acknowledge mental health as, a, as much of a challenge as it is. So, Mr. Speaker, yes, while we have been building in supports in uh, school boards and in community uh, services, Mr. Speaker, there's more that has to be done, and that's why we're putting billions of Thank dollars you. into health care, into mental health care as part of our budget, Mr. Okay. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Premier. I can tell you last night the stories were shocking, and there was tears everywhere including mine. At our health care town hall last night, we heard from individuals whose grandmother was in hospital. She was waiting for a bed in long-term care. She needed to be in long-term care, and when waiting in the hospital for long-term care bed, she was being charged by the Niagara Health System. She received a bill for over $3,000. Wow. Speaker. Will the Premier explain why seniors in our province are getting charged thousands of dollars for a stay in a publicly funded hospital, simply because her Liberal government has created a shortage of long-term beds? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I, I would have to have the details of that situation. I don't know, I don't know the details of that situation, and Mr. Speaker, certainly, certainly we recognize that if someone needs long-term care, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Write it down. Premier. 
then they have every right to get that care, Mr. Speaker. What we do know is that in Ontario right now, um, there is a, a range of supports that's needed. We are building more long-term long care beds, Mr. Speaker. We're upgrading yeah. thousands. We're building 5,000 uh, new and then uh, 30,000 over the next 10 years, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that there's more that needs to be done, but there also are tra transition beds that are needed. We need to make sure that people get the home care that they need. There's a whole range of supports in which we are investing, Mr. Mr. Speaker, as Thank part you. of our budget. New question, member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. This past weekend, the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport held their sports symposium in Toronto. The theme of this year's symposium was From Playground to Podium. The idea behind this theme was to explore ways in which the sports sector can engage children and youth and keep them involved in sport throughout their lives. As a soccer mom to Andre and David, I know and we all know that children who participate in organized sport or experience positive benefits fits in all aspects of their lives, not just physical health. And through conversations and feedback that our government received during this year's sports symposium, we will continue to build on the strides made to encourage children and youth to get moving. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you tell the members of this House what we have already done to support participation in sport? Here, here. Thank you, Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sport. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Davenport for that question, who was also a fabulous soccer mom. Uh, the sports symposium was very special. We relaunched the Ontario Sport Awards. Ontario's children and youth need to know that they're entering into a system that's always going to support them. Now, last year alone, Speaker, we released the Advancing Women and Girls in Sport Action Plan, giving women and girls equal access to opportunities in sport. And through Rowan's Law, we passed groundbreaking concussion safety legislation to protect athletes. We have also supported a number of high-profile sporting competitions, such as the 2018 Ontario Winter Games in Aurelia. And, Speaker, I attended the opening ceremonies, and let me tell you, those kids were really pumped to be there. The Games had over 3,000 participants. They competed in about 25 different sports. So, Speaker, our commitments to boosting the quality of life for people shows that the strides that we've made to continue yes, are going to make life better for people to come in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. And I'm sure that my girls from Girls Government here today are happy that we did release the Advancing Women and Girls in Sport Action Plan. It's amazing to see that over the last year alone, your ministry has supported 24 events through the Sport Hosting Program, a program that provides funding to help applicants deliver national and international amateur sport events in Ontario. These events promote tourism and, boast, and boost local economies by providing major sport events to local communities. And I think it's safe to say that our hard work is paying off for Ontario's athletes. Right. But there's always more to do and there's always room for improvement. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can the minister speak to other programs in place to support an active lifestyle? Thank you, minister. Thank you, and thanks to the member from Davenport. And I've got good news for the young girls who are sitting up there in the visitor's gallery today. In the past year, we invested $50 million to promote participation in sport and to build capacity. We've also committed to continual investment in Ontario's after-school programs, which provides 22,000 children and youth with opportunities to access sport, recreation, nutrition, and personal wellness. And just this past weekend, Speaker, we presented the Game On Progress Report, our annual sports symposium. Our sport plan offers athletes, coaches, and officials a chance to excel in sport, and it supports 60 sport organizations all across the province. We are committed to boosting active living speaker, and that's why we're also investing over $90 million this year in cycling alone to build more bike lanes and trails right across the province. And I want to highlight, Speaker, that we've gone a step further in introducing the toughest road safety legislation in North America, keeping cyclists, Answer. pedestrians, and other vulnerable road users safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any question? The member from Bruce Green. Thank South. you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Let me read you a passage from a recent Toronto Life article. They discovered that her bed was in what Sunnybrook staff called the orange zone, essentially a holding area for patients when no rooms are available. Her bed was pushed up against a wall with the IV pole and other paraphernalia wedged in beside her. He had nowhere to sit, so he stood awkwardly next to her until a nurse kindly brought him a chair. There was a curtain but no switch to turn off the lights at night. 
That location would be the patient's home for the next 19 hours. Premier, is that a health care system that you're proud of? Mr. Speaker, you know, as I have said many times, we have recognized and we have been investing in hospitals $500 million last year in our budget. New money, Mr. Speaker. This year, $822 million. We recognize as the, uh, the population ages, Mr. Speaker, uh, there are more concerns. People are uh, sicker. There are more of them, Mr. Speaker, who need care. So that's exactly why in our budget we have made such a significant investment. We're investing more than an additional $5 billion over the next three years to provide better access and more uh, services uh, in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And what that includes is $2.1 billion for better and faster access to mental health and addiction services. We're going to expand OHIP Plus to make prescriptions completely free for um, everyone 65 and over. They already are free yes, for everyone. Uh, to their 25th birthday, Mr. Speaker, and we're reducing wait times by uh, investing an additional, as I said, $822 million, and that's the single largest investment in hospitals in almost a decade. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Premier, let's not forget you wasted $8 billion on e-health, and there's nothing to show for that. This government, your government, has had 15 years to fix this, and instead we get this. You've made things worse. Let me read you another paragraph. 38 hours had elapsed since the patient had arrived, so her husband was surprised to find that she hadn't been moved into a room, but was instead in a hallway. She had a dressing on her right arm that stretched from her bicep down to her fingers, and on another on her left arm that went from the elbow to the fingers. There she was, lying in the hallway of one of the Canada's premier hospitals, still waiting for surgery. 38 hours. Does the Premier really think 38 hours is acceptable to wait in a hallway? Is this really the Ontario health care system the Premier wants to leave behind? Disgusting. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess I understand why the member opposite would want to talk down a terrific institution like Sunnybrook, but, but Mr. Speaker, I was at Sunnybrook. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound is warned. Finish, please. I was at Sunnybrook this morning, and of course, Mr. Speaker, when there are specific instances like this, and I don't know the details of this, Mr. Speaker, but when there are situations like this, then they're unacceptable, absolutely. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that there are remarkable things happening in Sunnybrook and in hospitals around the province, Mr. Speaker. And what we know is that the $822 million that we are investing as, uh, as part of our budget, Mr. Speaker, will provide 26,000 additional MRI operating hours, 14,000 more surgical Answer. medical procedures, 3,000 more cardiac procedures, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know that these investments are needed, but, Mr. Speaker, already the frontline workers across this province are Thank doing you. remarkable work for the people of Ontario. Your question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Earlier this week, I was disappointed when the minister refused to commit to ending the unfair limits to auto workers' leave days. Again, I say this isn't right and it isn't fair. Auto workers deserve the same employment standards and rights as every other worker in this province. I have since learned that not only are cleaners in auto plants finding their job titles redesignated as auto workers so that their leave days can be clawed back, but there have also been employers across this prov province who have taken their cue from the government and have issued notices that they will now only allow seven personal emergency leave days. These are employers who had previously been giving their workers 10 days. Speaker, Ontarians deserve security in the workplace. We should not be competing in a race to the bottom. And once again, I ask, will you commit to immediately ending this unfair exemption for auto workers? Question. Thank you, Premier. Minister of Labour. That question. Uh, Speaker, January the 1st of 2017, we went out, we talked to the industry stakeholders, we, we talked to others that were engaged in auto, organized labor, speaker, business, anybody that was involved Lots in uh, the auto sector in the province of Ontario, which is very healthy, which is very competitive, yeah. Speaker, <laughs> and has received tremendous support from this government like and from time to time other winter. members of the House. What we put in place, Speaker, was a pilot project. We wanted to look at the auto sector, and we wanted to examine if there was a different way of providing well, personal emergency sense. leave that made sense yeah. and took into account the competitive nature and other, um, other uh, unique parts of the auto sector, Speaker. 
Speaker, we've been out there for about a year with the pilot sector, or with okay. the pilot project. We continue to talk to those that are involved in this issue, Speaker. Answer. It is a pilot project, and you have my commitment that when we examine it, we're going to do a very thorough examination, yeah. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, and calling something a pilot project isn't enough to smooth over the fact it's still discriminatory. And again to the Premier, if you won't do the right thing, then I will. This afternoon, I am going to be joined by members of Unifor, and I will table my private member's bill, the Fairness for Auto Workers Sector Act. My bill will do what both the Liberals and Conservatives voted against during committee for Bill 148. It will ensure that every worker in Ontario will have access to the same minimum number of leave days without exception. Speaker, my bill will close the loophole that the Liberals have created. Premier, I've done the heavy lifting of drafting the bill, and will you do the right thing and ensure that my bill, the Fairness for the Auto Sector Act, becomes law before the session ends? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, thank you. Thank you for the supplementary. Speaker, just last week, the Minister of Transportation and I met with Jerry Dias from Unifor. Speaker, oh, the we met with a number of unionized members of the auto sector, Excellent. and we went with the non-unionized uh, auto workers on this issue. Speaker, I believe we're all on the same page right now. Speaker, Good that news. now is the time to evaluate the efficacy of the pilot project okay. to see if it works. Speaker, to see if it needs to be changed. So I'm proud to be able. To the member from Windsor West is warned. Finish, please. Speaker, I'm proud to announce today that we've appointed Buzz Hargrove, Buzz Hargrove. former leader of the CAW, and Stacey Allerton, the former vice president of Human uh, Resources at Answer. Ford Motor Company, former director of Human Resources for Ford Sorry. in the United States. Speaker, but I find it passing strange Thank you. when Bill 148 was moving through the House. Not a piece Thank you. Of the wow. the minister knows when I stand, he sits. New question. Member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, children, children's treatment centres provide rehabilitation services for children and youth with special needs and their families. There are 21 of these centres across the province providing services to more than 81,000 children and youth with special needs. Last month, I was very proud to join the Premier at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario to announce our commitment to the Ottawa Children's Treatment Center. And I know last week the government announced in Oakville the opening of a new Aaron Oaks Kids facility. Minister, can you share with the House the details of this announcement? Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I want to take a moment just to recognize the advocacy and the work for the minister, a member from Ottawa South, uh, and his continued work to support Children's Hospital in Ottawa. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I joined the, uh, the Premier, the Minister uh, of Labour, the Treasurer, and the Minister of Education uh, uh, at Aaron Oaks uh, earlier this, uh, this week. And, and we, we got to uh, meet some incredible families, and uh, I'm very, uh, very happy that um, this government has uh, invested over $163 million to uh, uh, complete this project. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, this is an expansion of uh, uh, doubling the space to th over 300,000 square feet, and the footprint will take place in Mississauga, Brampton, and, and Oakville. Um, Minister of Labour, uh, the MPP for Oakville, has been advocating for this project for years, yes. and I want to take Answer. an opportunity to thank him uh, for Great really work. building a, uh, a better uh, facility in his community to serve wow. many families uh, across yep. that region. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that response. Uh, speaker, centres like Aaron Oaks and the Ottawa Children's Treatment Centre allow children with cognitive and physical disabilities to get the support they need in their home communities. And I, Speaker, I know that we will continue to support children's treatment centres and the children and youth with special needs. And while it is incredibly important to invest in the centres themselves, we also need to invest in high-quality services. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister. Could he tell us more about our government's investments in special needs services? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, last week, when I joined uh, members of this government at Aaron Oaks, um, I got to witness firsthand the high-quality, coordinated, integrated services uh, uh, 
um, that are developed uh, through the Ontario Special Needs Strategy to help connect children to services that they need as early as possible. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my ministry uh, is investing over $630 million in services this year alone. The investments include almost $320 million to autism services, almost $120 for children's treatment rehabilitation services, over $100 million to complex special needs, $85 million uh, for, for healthy uh, child development programs. And in our 2018 budget, we're allocating more than $300 million in new funding over three years for additional 2,000 new teachers, specialized wow. support staff, Answer. and educational Answer. workers. Mr. Speaker, this is how we make a difference for Ontarians, by making sure that we add services, not cuts. The question, the member from Chatham, Kent Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. The recent ice storm had a devastating effect on cities and towns throughout southwestern Ontario. My riding of Chatham, Ken Essex, was especially hit hard. Media reports described strong winds and heavy rain, which sent huge waves crashing in on the shore of Lake Erie in the Chatham, Kent, and Point Pelee and Leamington areas. I've already spoken to John Patterson, mayor of Leamington, who has confirmed the devastation. There was break wall damage and shoreline erosion, and roads were completely washed out. Water levels were so high in the Wheatley Harbor that fishing boats ended up on top of the docks and the boat launch was completely destroyed. <coughs> Residents are saying that the ice storm and flooding are the worst disaster they've seen in the past several decades. Minister, have any of your officials yet visited the area to assess the damage? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, thank you uh, to the member for the question. I, I first want to acknowledge the work uh, of the first responders, and I know the minister from, of MCS SCS has, has been involved in providing a coordinating function to ensure that any support that's needed from first responders uh, can be provided and help to be coordinated. Also, uh, natural resources and forestry, I know, is providing a monitoring function when it comes to these sorts of flooding incidents. Uh, speaker, what I would say directly to the member in response to his question that in the first instance, this sounds like it is more about municipal infrastructure, not so much about flooding in people's homes, although that is yet to be determined with final certainty. But because of that, we know that the municipal crews are on the ground doing their work. They will ultimately, at some point, provide information back to us as a ministry, and then we will determine if we will activate our program. I would add, Speaker, to that, is that we have changed the program. We have lowered the threshold for municipal infra infrastructure to be eligible under the new program from 4 per cent to 3 per cent of own purpose tax revenue. So there's a possibility, based on their information, that it may be activated. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, back to the minister, and I appreciate that response, Minister. You know, more than 35,000 hydro customers were without power over the weekend, and property has been destroyed. Houses have been ruined. Hydro One crews worked around the clock to restore power, and our first responders, and I appreciate your comment regarding them, our first responders rescued many residents stranded due to flooding and road erosion. They were responsible for saving lives and preventing serious injuries, and I want to thank them personally, as you did as well. But as I mentioned, the damage has been severe. Minister, your ministry promised to help in the last bout of flooding in southwestern Ontario. That was a few months ago, as you may recall. And I truly appreciated your visit to the riding of Chatham, Ken Essex. Minister, you and I, we need to work together. It's not about us. It's about the constituents in the riding. So, Minister, question? my question is simply, what specifically will you do to help us out this time? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, in addition to the municipal portion, I know that there's been a phone line set up for residents to phone in and advise of any impacts on their own homes. So that information will come to us and we'll determine whether or not our DRAO team visits the city to determine if there's been any personal circumstances. But you know, as the member states, Speaker, this is about people. This is an emergency. This is an acute situation. It's a very, very serious issue, but I cannot help but make the comment that at some point there has to be some signal from the other side and you and your leader that you're going to get it and you're going to buy in that things have changed on the ground. I'll give you some stats, Speaker. From 2005 to 2010, 17 declared disasters requiring 18 million of provincial, or 8 million of provincial assistance. 2010 to 15, 43 disasters requiring 36 million. And it continues to increase in severity. 
Your leader is taking a position on this file that Answer. seems to believe or imply that he's not taking it seriously at all. This is about people. We're taking it seriously. We have programs to Thank respond. You. I would hope that you'd buy in on this. Your question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, a report released today by the AODA Alliance contains some shameful facts. Ontarians with disabilities still face too many barriers when they apply for jobs, try and access public transit, go to school, access hospitals, or try and or go out to eat, activities that many of us take for granted. Worse, there was little or no enforcement of the laws that would ensure this access. In the five years since the law passed, 57 per cent of businesses have not even filed the required exception accessibility reports. Only two fines have ever been levied for non-compliance. What is the Premier going to do to ensure that accessibility laws in Ontario Question. are followed? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Responsible for Accessibility. Mr. Responsible Thank for Accessibility. Thank you, Speaker. So we know that Ontario is a global leader when it comes to accessibility. Canada's first jurisdiction to adopt accessibility standards. We remain committed, remain committed to our goal to have an accessible province by 2025. And although there's always been resources dedicated to compliance and enforcement, uh, to, to respond to my expanded mandate, Speaker, we reorganize Accessibility Directorate to reflect and uh, create uh, a dedicated branch on compliance and enforcement. And I'm pleased to say, Speaker, that compliance reporting rates continue to increase. Around 24,000 businesses completed their 2017 accessibility compliance reports by this, this past December. And, Speaker, that represents a 20 percent increase over the previous reporting deadline, and more than 6,000 businesses filed the compliance reports for the very first time this year. We've also experienced increased reporting rates amongst businesses, not-for-profits, and we'll Thank continue you. to work with them to make Ontario accessible. The Thank point you. of order, the member from Holdem and Norfolk. Point of order, Speaker. Uh, history teacher Ron Smith has brought his grade 12 history class here, uh, Simcoe High School, my former high school. and. Uh, a school named after Ontario's first lieutenant uh, governor, John Gray Simcoe. Welcome. The member from Oshawa on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker, and I am happy to welcome to the legislature Emil Naboot from Unifor 195 in Windsor and Joel Smith from Oshawa, Unifor Local 222, here this afternoon for my press conference. Welcome Thank to Queen's Park. Davenport, point of order. Uh, earlier this morning, I introduced all the girls from Girls' Government, but uh, did not introduce Daniel Rabello, who's all, all here as well, to join the group of girls here for a visit at Queen's Park. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.